All right, everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome to another Road Reflection. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope uh, I hope things wherever you are are uh, as amazing as as you'd like them to be. And we are we are kicking this off. We are kicking this episode off. Little old school style episode again. Uh, I guess second generation style episode. I guess the old school type of Road Reflections would be if I did them. Uh, in my car with my big giant notebook uh, of notes and such. Um, yeah, it's been it's it's a hectic week. It's a hectic week. So you might you might have noticed that there isn't really uh, any taboo table talks or anything like that. And these are going to be kind of a little bit of quicker videos of stuff that I wanted to kind of address and talk about um, follow ups on some things. Uh, like I did last week, we we followed up on the teachers union stuff, uh, things of that sort. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 a little bit of a, a hectic week. Uh, there's a lot going on. I have a new side gig that I've started, so I've kind of got to adjust my schedule to to fit all that stuff in. Uh, new relationship, personal life things, um, big life events have taken place. And, uh, and I'm still trying to keep up with the, you know, the regular amount of content that I normally put out. It's just a matter of adjusting the schedule. And this week particularly has been a little difficult in that regard. Um, I've got, uh, I've got, uh, two shows with the Fringe Festival, the Providence Fringe Festival, uh, tomorrow, well, July 30th. Is that tomorrow? When this video comes out, it won't be. It'll be today. It'll be the day that this video comes out. Uh, so <laughs> it won't be tomorrow. It will be, it will be to, it will be today, July 30th and 31st, 6 PM Eastern. Um, if you want to be part of that live virtual audience, uh, please go ahead and shoot me an email. Uh, let me know. I will, uh, send you the login information about an hour before the show. Uh, so that once again, today and tomorrow, uh, July 30th and 31st. Uh, I will be uh, doing the uh, Providence Fringe Festival, doing a version of the Citizen Revolution. It'll be sort of a truncated, semi-best of kind of show. Uh, a little bit, a little bit like a stand-up show with uh, trying to have a narrative arc to it, uh, rather than you know sort of the themed shows that I've been doing. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's that. I'm, I'm also going to be doing a show with the. Uh, Indian Association of Greater Boston, I believe that's what they're called. Um, I'll be sharing the, the, the link to this on my Facebook page, but it is going to be a live stream uh, event. Um, so I, I'll, be, I'll be streaming that. Uh, and sorry, I got distracted there for a minute. but I'll be streaming that uh streaming that uh that's on Friday at 9 p.m eastern as well so if you want to check out that set it'll be a little bit of a stand-up set it'll be might be a little strange there, there probably isn't going to be like an audience uh so it might be a little strange we'll see how it goes um and then the citizen revolution the the, the standard way that I've been doing the citizen revolution for the last two months is going to come back uh, which is, uh, you know, we pick a theme, we pick a, a particular topic, and I build a show around that, and then those will be chopped up and become episodes of Forkful of Noodles. Uh, if you are a sustaining member, you probably haven't seen the July 17th show go up on the Patreon page, um, and uh, that's my bad, uh, and <laughs> that's partly because it's been, like I said, kind of crazy. Uh, crazy week, a lot of life, of, a lot of things have come up, so I'm, I'm, I'm a wee bit behind and I'm doing my best to catch up. Another thing that has come up is my Rockfin page. I've launched it. I have uh, been uploading uh, all of the backlog content. Um, you know, so every, all the, basically it went to the Forkful of Noodles from um, earlier this year. Basically everything from 2020. Um, and then, you know, kind of uh, the dispatches and the road reflections that I thought would work without having some, you know, very like the things that are super timely I didn't put up there. Uh, more more sort of evergreen topics are, are up there as well. So uh, so if you're watching this uh, on Rockfin itself, welcome. Thank you for watching this on Rockfin. Uh, you're fucking awesome for for doing that. You're helping. Um, 
you're 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 helping content creators uh, earn an income off of their off of their work on an uncensored platform and an, on on a platform that believes in paying content creators, uh, you know, based on the subscribers, based on uh, crypto blockchain, and being fair about the way uh, that the content is found and 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 viewed by the uh, by the followers essentially. And if you are not viewing this on Rockfin, go to Rockfin.com slash Haha. Check out those videos. Uh, check out the, the become a subscriber if you want, especially if you're like a big YouTube fan um, and you're sick of the commercials, you're sick of the censorship. Uh, there's a lot of really great content creators on there from Graham Elwood to Jimmy Dore, Ron Bacone, um, uh, Richard Mendhurst, Nico House, Hardlands Media, uh, who else? Kim Iverson, um, Convo Couch, uh, Uphill Media. There's a ton of folks that are migrating on there and, and they're adding more and more uh, content creators. Right now it's a mix of like political commentary type co uh, content and uh, like MMA content, which is kind of a weird blend. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a weird blend, um, but that's what's up there right now. And, uh, and the channel and, and the platform's growing. So highly recommend you go check that. You go check out that platform, you guys. Um, it is, like I said, it is a crypto blockchain um, uh, website that uh, I'm probably not doing an awesome job of explaining it. I will do like a big video launch thing uh, where I will, uh, you know, have like the right words to say and shit. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, basically, it's it, you, you become a subscriber and then every and then the content creators get paid. Uh, that's that's sort of the way it works. And the and the the way they get paid is a crypto blockchain methodology of getting paid. So. Uh, you know, for, for people that view, uh, people that subscribe to my channel uh, or become subscribed via my channel, um, you know, it means that I will, I will get to earn income off of the videos that I make, uh, you know, and the other ways that I'm currently earning an income is through the Patreon, through the sustaining members, which for everybody that has become sustaining members, uh, you guys are fucking dope. Uh, thank you guys so much. And for everybody that is thinking about it, uh, you know, let me know. Hopefully, hopefully you can become a sustaining member. Uh, you, you basically help me, uh, earn a living off of this stuff. Uh, you know, that means that there, there's more time spent in, uh, improving the quality and quantity of shows like this, uh, of Road Reflections, Tap and Table Talk, The Dispatches, and of course, Forkful of Noodles, Sessions and Revolutions shows. So, um... Yeah, that's that's sort of where things are right now. Uh, so yeah, thank you for being patient in terms of like the release of content. Um, you know, especially around this time, you guys have been cool about staying patient. I always get a little anxious about it, to be honest. You know, like I'm not doing enough, or I'm not putting enough shit out there, what have you, and then I get a little nervous about it because um, because uh, I'm like I don't want people to forget, blah blah blah. It's just stupid anxiety shit. It's just what it is, and then you kind of deal with it, and you're just like, hey, if I tell people, like, I've got a busy week, or I'm, I'm stressed out, overwhelmed, or I'm sick, or I'm whatever, uh, most people understand, you know, like, you guys are super cool about it, uh, you know, and, and, I, I, and I think the last two weeks, I kind of got burned out dealing with, um, how do I put this uh, appropriately without being a dick, because uh, I don't want to be a dick about this, um, just, I guess, like, neoliberal, fucking centrist, you know, don't, don't, don't go too extreme kind of, you know, pro-democratic party kind of folks. Um, because the, the series of videos that I'm releasing on Forkful of Noodles right now is about the uh, election system and you know I, I don't think this should be a surprise to anybody that regularly views anything that I do or follows my work or has kept up with any of the words that I have said in quite in the last couple of years and even beyond that right even before that this is sort of um, the, just the way that I am is I am not an any blue will do kind of person um, I am more about the ideas and the philosophies and Ron Placone talked about this on my podcast. When he did my podcast, you know, we, we talked about following these politicians um, as people that are that are in the political comedy sphere. You know, like Ron and I were followers of Tulsi, like followers being like we we liked what they had to say, not like we built a shrine in our fucking house to, 
you know, uh, I had a Bernie and a Tulsi pin on a jacket that I had, you know, so um, Bernie and Tulsi were kind of the, the candidates that uh, I liked the most and was probably the two candidates that I would have voted for. Uh, that's really the, the way that it boils down. And uh, once they kind of dropped out of the race and endorsed Joe Biden, I, as well as several other people, expressed how disappointed they were in that endorsement. And that just kind of led to a bunch of these neoliberal, pro-democratic party, pro-DNC, let's do what the party says, but we're free thinkers and we're super smart and we're critically thinking and all this other kind of, but it's just like, no, you're kind of just saying what the party wants you to say and floating a lot of these CIA talking point things. Um, I've caught a lot of vitriol from those folks. And what's interesting, too, about, the, about that sort of stuff is I will say out of all of the comments that I received, and I get, I get that this is sort of a social media thing, but it does, it, I don't know if you've gotten in, like, if that's not your thing, like, my thing is not to get into, like, battles over uh, silly things on the Internet. It's really not. I hate it. Um, it's, it's more or less like, I'm cool with having a discussion based on, hey, you know, you mentioned XYZ in your video and I'm not a big fan of it. Here's why. Cool. Now we can have a conversation, right? Like that's something that I'm, I'm cool. I'm down with. That's, that sounds great. Uh, but these guys were just like, you're posting this video. It's like, I'll post a, a, a thing. I'll, I'll say a thing, right? I'll, I'll have to type up like a status or whatever on Facebook. And, uh, and it's something to kind of entice you to watch the video, right? And that's just sort of the way that social media works. It's sort of the way that we are now engineered to view content is if it doesn't have uh, a kitschy title, if it doesn't have kind of a clickbaity thing, then people aren't gonna watch it. And also the algorithm is gonna bury it. And most of these people don't know that. And I get that, but you know, they're like, well, summarize it. No, watch the video. And I'm happy to have a discussion so I went back and forth. That was one thing I went back and forth with where people were like, I don't want to watch a fucking video for the clicks and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you understand that watching a video on Facebook means I still make zero dollars from this content. Like, <laughs> I make no fucking money off of it. And there were people that were just like, summarize it, summarize it. And, I, and my summary was, watch the video and I will have a conversation with you about the context content of the video. That's the point of me posting the video, right? If I, if I, if I, if I didn't want to, I would have just posted this vague statement about not voting for either party. And that would have been it. And then we would have, you would have commented and I would have commented back and eventually it would have been an insult fest, right? But the other thing too is like a bunch of these people went straight to insults and I was just like, okay, so I would kind of say something semi snarky, a little, little, little dry and sarcastic towards them, uh, and that's just my nature. And I know part of it is me being defensive, right? But boy, it, it's it was it was very emotionally taxing to go through all this. And then I had a bunch of other people coming at me, and again, it was the same thing of just like, yo, watch the video, and I'm happy to have a discussion about the contents of the video and, and why you either disagree or agree with me. And a bunch of people would come in and be like, well, you made fun of Hillary Clinton, so I'm done. And it was like, so you have no interest in hearing a different perspective. You have every interest in either one being told what you need to believe and just kind of going along with that, or you just want your opinions validated. And when somebody doesn't validate your opinion, you don't know how to validate your own opinion because I don't know, you don't, you like, you don't have a, like agency over your own thoughts. I don't, I don't really know. Like, I don't, I know that kind of sounds like a dickish thing to say, but maybe you fucking don't. I don't know. So it was just very exhausting. And it's just like all of these people and, I'm, and I come out too, is like, there's no discourse. There's no discourse happening. And part of the, I, part of this I also understand is like, that's how Facebook makes it. Facebook makes it so you can't have intelligent discourse about particular topics they want the the vitriol and the back and forth and the and the argumentative type shit because that's what they do that's how they thrive that's how they keep people on board but for me it's like it was just too much i just don't do well with it you know if if it if i and i'm relatively quick at figuring this sort of judgment out is we went from 
like one of the comments was we went from like who I voted for said I can't vote. I was an immigrant or who I voted for in 2016. I said I couldn't vote in 2016 because I was still an immigrant um, and I can't vote, which meant that I voted for Trump is how liberals saw it. And that's a 100 percent true thing. It's like I would say that to liberals and they would fucking be like, well, you got Trump elected. And it's like, I literally fucking can't. I, what do you want me to do? So, you know, then he came out as a centrist. And I was like, look, man, I'm not a centrist. I've never claimed to be a centrist. I've never claimed to be a Democrat. And when people find out that I'm an immigrant and I'm brown and I'm from India, like they want me to be a Democrat. But I, I've, I've never claimed any sort of party affiliation. So why are you getting mad at me that I don't I've I'm not a thing that I've ever claimed to be. And, you know, and then he did. And then he started calling me names, said I was dangerous. And then it, to a comment later, he said that I was a know nothing part. Like my videos don't matter because nobody watches my videos anyway. And I was just like, OK, so so which one is it? Am I am I dangerous? Am I am I nothing? And I called it vitriolic hypocrisy. And, you know, and then it was just like two other people came in and I was just like, I don't have time for this. Like, I'm tr I get that having a dialogue is important, but this is just ridiculous. And no, and I posted about this on Twitter and stuff. And, you know, it's just like the amount of vitriol and hate that I get from the Democrats and the liberals, you know, and the neoliberals and these like any blue will do people is beyond anything that I've faced. At least at least the conservatives that hate me will come out and just say that they want to murder me to my face instead of this roundabout way of making an assumption about who I am, finding out who I actually am, and then getting mad at the fact that they didn't have the assumption correctly and somehow I'm responsible for that. And then telling me that I'm dangerous, which is like, no, I'm pretty sure Nancy Pelosi is more dangerous than I am, considering she's leaving the American people behind with bullshit fucking theatrics and putting no effective pieces of legislation forward. I'm pretty sure Mitch McConnell is more dangerous considering he blocks every piece of effective legislation. Both of these people are, are more dangerous than me, for sure. Someone with no money and no power that has a YouTube and Rockfin channel that is getting off the ground, that gets suppressed on YouTube and Facebook pretty regularly. So, you know, why are you not pushing back on them? And they can't because they worship them as heroes and they need to have a passive relationship with voting, which if they watched my video about that, they would know that that's one of the things that I say in it, but they didn't. So how would they fucking know? So they make these out of context arguments. And I, and I call them I, again. It's just like, look, if you're going to make these out of context arguments where you're not staying to what I'm actually talking about and then you circumvent it and you go way over there to make a different point and try to loosely connect it with what I'm saying. It's just like, well, you didn't talk about race. It's because I'm not talking about race and voting right now. I'm talking about any blue will do. Well, you didn't talk about this. Okay, but I'm talking about like money and politics right now. So, you know, it's like, let's, let's stay on task when you don't have anything to say about the subject that I have to actually say about. You, you just kind of d divert, deflect, and then resort to name calling and pretend that you're holier than thou. And that's part of the reason why, you know, I stopped calling myself a liberal five, six years ago. I'm not really a conservative, I, progressive, I, yeah, I guess, you know, like, I, but really, like, I'm probably a socialist. Like, that's, that's pretty much what I line up with. I support the people. I support the labor movement. I'm, I'm pro-unions. Uh, Eugene Debs is probably the person that has the closest political leanings to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> so... You know, but but they but they can't deal with something like that. They they every time I say some stuff like that, and you know, it's just like people will come back and be like, "Well, you don't fucking understand." I'm not here. My identity as a brown Indian immigrant is not here to validate your political identity. 
people have roped themselves up into making the political party their identity so much that they take it out on people that kind of push back on the party because the party has become the identity. And corporations have done this too, is, you know, they in West Virginia and stuff like that. It, yeah, and it's, that I mean, that vitriolic hypocrisy is what kind of comes out. Anyway, I know that was kind of a long <laughs> aside. I didn't actually mean to talk about that as much, but uh, it's just like, so it's. I mean, it literally just happened right before I was recording this video. And, and you know, I kind of had to, so it's just been in the front, forefront of my mind. Uh, but let's get into these videos because I, I, these, well, videos were, were in the video. Um, let's get into these two topics that we have for today. Uh, so last week we talked about the uh, federal agents that are uh, kidnapping people in Portland. And uh, these are unmarked, uh, they were in unmarked minivans and they were wearing military fatigues and they were no name tags, no agency name. They, and they were just grabbing people um, from the street that fit the profile uh, of, a, of a Black Lives Matter protester or something. And they would take them to the courthouse and process them and take their shit, never read them their rights, never tell them what they did wrong, so on and so forth, right? Uh, so they've, they've lost. They got defeated. They have to uh, leave Portland now. Um, Portland was the, was the first stop for them. I think Chicago, uh, Kansas, a couple other cities were also on that list um, of, of, of places that they were going to go and target. So... The protesters uh, pushed back. I think this was like a week and a half, two weeks of, of standoffs. Um, and eventually they were defeated and now they have to leave Portland, right? Um, and, and I'm not really sure if, if this is going to continue. I, I, would, I would wager to bet that it will. I will wager to bet that it will continue. Like I, I would wager to bet that it, in a week or two in Chicago, we will see this shit again. I Probably. Right. So uh, this is what the governor of Oregon had to say. Kate Brown, Oregon Governor Kate Brown, announced Wednesday that the federal officers brought in to quell the anti-racism protests in Portland will leave the city beginning Thursday after weeks of violent clashes with demonstrators. So federal officers have acted as an occupying force, refused accountability and brought violence and strife to our community. Uh, which is true, which is true, right? I mean, that's sort of the thing that they do. There's always an escalation when cops and military and ride gear show up. That's just something that happens. And we know that that's something that happens. It, yeah, everything will be peaceful. The cops show up and then everybody gets tense, right? Everybody gets worried. What are these guys doing? Why are they here? So on and so forth. And, and then because they're tense, anything can kind of set it off. And usually it's the cops. Usually it's the cops that set it off. Like in Portland, a guy that was holding up a boombox got shot in the face with a rubber bullet. And it's completely legal and it's completely fine because they consider that to be a less than lethal weapon, but the dude had to have facial reconstructive surgery. How is that less than lethal? It's not less than lethal. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it, they, they totally escalate the situation and they're known to escalate these situations. They use tear gas, they use rubber bullets, uh, they use uh, the, the paintball, pepper balls, they pepper spray people all the time. These are not de-escalation tactics. They're going to escalate the things. They kettle these protesters, they, and then they march at them as a military force, right? So they're using military strategy against civilians protesting, um, you know, against racial injustice, against, the, against police brutality, um, against violence, violent policing. And you can see here, um, uh, they're, they're saying that it's a phased withdrawal uh, after talks with uh, VP Mike Pence, which basically means that this occupation is going to continue for a while. Like, they're going to say they're going to start leaving on Thursday, but, but it, it might take four or five weeks for them to get out of Portland completely. Uh, and like I said, it, it, it also reports that this is, clashes with anti-racism protesters. So the federal agents were attacking anti-racism protesters, which makes these federal agents racists. 
like, isn't that, just, isn't that just blatantly coming out and saying it? And they're just coming out and saying it at this point, right? Like, they're just coming, they're just like, these anti-racists gotta be stopped. Why? What side are you on? Well, we can tell you we're not anti-racists. Are you pro-race? We can tell you that we're not anti-racists. But that's a double negative, so it cancels it out. So it kind of just makes you, hey, I'm not saying nothing, but all I'm saying is I ain't no anti-racist. Okay? That's it. So they're basically, these federal agents just kind of came out and said that they're racist. Here's the fun thing. Um, I thought this was kind of, this was kind of a hilarious uh, hilarious little thing that uh, that they have to do here is uh, if we look at the top it says before they go the federal officers will also clean up the courthouse removing graffiti Brown said which I think is fucking hilarious because if you're look if you're gonna shoot a rubber bullet at somebody's face and uh, you know uh, cause them to have facial reconstructive surgery the least you can do is fucking clean up the courthouse which the violence only escalated because of you Fucking protesters weren't using rubber bullets and tear gas. Just you. Just the fucking federal officers. Portland police can't even use it. Portland police is banned from using um, tear gas. You know, because it's a chemical weapon. Um, and remember how everybody was mad that, uh, oh, we didn't do anything because Assad gasses people. It's like, well, here we are, gassing our own people. What does that mean? Does that mean that the other countries get to invade us? Take out the government in power? Enact a little regime change in America? Is that what it's going to fucking take? We're gassing our own people. Geneva Conventions does not, uh, does not really allow for uh, tear gas. So uh, the way that these guys were defeated was uh, well, be, because of solidarity, right? There were there was a wall of moms. These these moms came out in yellow shirts, uh, and then leaf blower dads that were using their leaf blowers to like blow away um, the tear gas, which is an effective way of of blowing away tear gas to ensure that uh, people don't get affected with tear gas. So basically, like, essentially, it kind of sounds like maybe some suburbanites came out. And that's that's gonna that's kind of gonna be the way that things pick up is when these affluent suburban family members are like, oh, this shit is real, this shit is serious, and we need to go participate in some way. Um, and you know, I've talked a lot about what your role in a protest can be, whether it is in the front lines, and maybe you're not a front line person, right? If you're not a front line person, look, there are still people that. You know, need to dispel water, bring extra masks, uh, first aid kits, some food. There's people that need to document what's going on. There's people that need to amplify the voices of what's going on. There's people that need to help fund what's going on. And then there's people that come in with motherfucking leaf blowers and blow up the, you know, the fucking tear gas, the chemical weapons that are being used against the American people. Uh, so, you know... And this was kind of like a coalition of a bunch of different groups coming together. Uh, and this, you know, this sort of shit has, we've seen this happen just recently where people were going to the Seattle CHOP autonomous zone and, you know, the media was saying that it's just, oh, it's this crazy death zone with no police and no rules. It's anarchy. There's people masturbating on the corners of every street. And you gotta, you know, you gotta give them a dollar to stop jacking it, and then they're 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 extorting small businesses within the area, and then so people would go down. They would be like, "Holy shit, this is crazy. We should," and then they go down. None of that stuff's happening, and everybody's just having a good, nice time. And you know, there's people giving out water and food and making sure people are taken care of. And it was kind of radicalizing people. And this is sort of the same thing. Is like, what is the escalation of continually having a a a souped up militaristic police force meet unarmed protesters. This is sort of the height of it. Is you send federal agents unmarked to start taking people away. Part of this is also the fact that the Democrats stay silent. Part of this is also the fact that the Republicans push this shit all the time. 
Part of this is a bunch of people coming out and being like, oh, defunding the police is too extreme of a movement. This is what happens when you overfund. There was a Navy veteran that they beat up too. This guy was basically another one of those people that saw what was going on. It was just like, we're sick. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this shit. This is not what I fought for. And then he went out. Um, they pepper sprayed him. They beat him. So they're anti-veteran now too. They're racist and they're anti-vets. How do you support some somebody like this? Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, right? It doesn't even fucking matter what, what party you align yourself up with. All that is bullshit anyway. It's all theatrics. <laughs> Most of this party shit is all theatrics. How do you support that? How do you support a, a, a agency and a force that is specifically going out targeting anti-racists and veterans who are also anti-racist? That makes you racist anti-veterans. That's so insane to me. And then there are still people that are like, this is what we need more of. Now, the, uh, the mayor of Portland uh, made some news. Ted, Ted, Ted Wheeler made some news when he joined the protest the other day. Uh, usually this stuff is like a PR stunt to me. Every time I see something like this, I'm like, that's, that's nice that you did it. But it kind of just seems like you're upping your social profile. Right. And, and then what it really does is there's this glorification of like, oh, one of us. Oh, man, he's just he's just like the people, man. He's just like he's just like a regular people, dude, man. Like it's, you know, and then they glorify him. Um, and, you know, and then and then they get to make excuses when they pass horrible pieces of legislation that fuck over the middle class, that, you know, let let people down, that give banks more control, that, you know, allow for more police force, more militarism of the police, you know, racism in the streets and racism in, in, in employment and, and uh, homes and all. And, and then they go, but he marched with us, bro. I kind like that's sort of the pattern that we see in these sort of situations. And I kind of see it as a PR stunt. And the other thing that kind of bugs me when this sort of stuff happens, too, is it takes away from the movement. It takes away from the people that really started the movement, that really launched this thing forward, right? It really, really takes away uh, from, the, from, from the wall of moms, the leaf lower dads, the veterans that are out there, the regular rank and file that have done the work to actually push back against this authoritarian force and then push them out of the city, period. That's where the strength and solidarity is, right? It's not from Mayor Wheeler or, or Governor Brown, but, but from the people actually pushing back. That's where it is. And, you know, the, the media picks up on it because this is a fun, feel-good story of a scary situation. So instead of talking about the reality of what it is and trying to have a, a rational discourse conversation about it, let's make it a fun, you know, popcorn event where we can go, oh, that's so nice. See, they are one of us. This is nice. This is nice. And then they kind of, you know, and they, 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 so it, it, feel, it, it always kind of feels like this is an opportunistic moment. Uh, so I want to kind of point out that that's kind of what this might be. And it's nice. And you can say, well, that's nice that Tom Wheeler was part of this thing or, or Ted Wheeler uh, was, was part of this thing. But really the... Uh, the people that are responsible for the, the federal agents to leave Portland are the people, are the regular rank and file, you know, the people that came together and said, enough is enough. We don't want this unconstitutional kidnapping of the American people. We are done with the cops being overfunded. We are done with the, with, with the, with the, the, the blatant disrespect of the civil rights movement. That and the people are saying that, not not the you know, uh, not the governor or or the mayor. They are now, but and I don't think they would have said anything had there not been <laughs> so many people pushing back, right? If if we would have just been like, eh, nothing would have been said or done. 
they would have been like, oh man, this seems not awesome. And then they would have been quiet about it. So right now, uh, there is a lawsuit against the Trump administration over violating the First Amendment. And, and a lot of people have called this an unconstitutional occupation. And it 100% is an unconstitutional occupation. They were not reading people their rights. Uh, they were violating, I believe, the Fourth Amendment as well as their First Amendment because they were going um, after people's freedom of speech and people's freedom to, to protest. They were saying that those are, those are not allowed. And again, this is sort of the, sh the kind of stuff like what the Espionage Act talked about, which is still in effect, and what the Patriot Act talks about, which is still in effect. Both things started by Democrats uh, and then big thumbs up from the fucking Republicans See how there's fucking bipartisan support when it has anything to do with challenging power, when it has anything to do with challenging the status quo. There's always bipartisan support. That's why you have bipartisan. That's why there, there's so many fucking Democrats out there that won't support Medicare for all. Because that takes power away from the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical industries who pay them a pretty nice paycheck. This is, a, this is an example of that. This is an example of, of how far power can go. And the laws that are in place, the legislations that are in place, the Espionage Act, the Patriot Act, all of these things that are in place have given people like Trump the authority to do this. So again, when they're making laws, they have to think about this sort of stuff, which they don't. And then when people like me co fucking comedians come out and they're like this seems like it could go really fucking south unless there's provisions set in place to not make it go south they're like oh well you're just you know you're you're a communist or you're a this you're oh man this guy's a radical this guy's an anarchist this guy's you know they'll 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 try to use words like socialism to insult me and and discount what i have to say that's a typical play that they do. Uh, and in this instance now, it's, it's what the Trump administration has done is kind of shone this huge light on it and expose all this stuff. But there's still people that are like, well, the Democrats are the good guys because they still can't. It's like trauma thinking, like when you're in a, tr in like a real traumatic situation and when your identity is hooked into a party instead of like ideas and people. Um, it, you kind of do that where, like, if you go after a political institution, they're like, you're coming after me. So when you point out the fact that the Democrats are as much responsible for authoritarian acts like this and authoritarian acts have existed in the United States for a very, very long time, when you point that out, they, they take it personally. And it's like, no, this is just history. This is like your country's history. There's an imperialistic and authoritarian history in the United States that isn't taught to you. But once you learn it, you can't fucking unlearn it. But the fact is that you have to accept it. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that this kind of encourages people to look into that history, to look into how far this really goes back um, and, and see that this, this goes beyond party lines. This is not a... DR issue. This is not a left right issue. It's not a liberal conservative issue. This is people uh, in power trying to secure their place in power. And we just showed them that they can't, that we're going to push back and we're going to shift that, 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 you know, seesaw of power back to us where it should be. All right. Our second story is a little bit of a short story, but um, you, th this is this is sort of the last week for that additional six hundred dollars a week for um, unemployment. I think they're saying that they're gonna. Well, well now they're saying that the unemployment's going to continue, but I think it's going down to two hundred. Is what I read. Um, I might be wrong about that figure. I'm not sure. Uh, so don't quote me. But but I believe it's two hundred. I could be wrong. Uh, but essentially, the, the argument from neoliberals, from conservatives, from the people that are, you know, against notions like UBI, against notions of um, any, any sort of like, quote unquote, welfare program, anything to really just financially help the people, 
right? And not bail out markets and not bail out capitalism. Uh, they always come out and say, well, if we give people money and de in, uh, de um, incentivizes them to work. Sorry, I lost the word there for a second. It de-incentivizes them to work, right? That if you if if somebody loses their job and you give them unemployment or they go on welfare or they go on some kind of financial assistance from the government or you know what have you, it's going to de uh, incentivize them from working. They're they're just not going to want to work and. The studies, a Yale study actually found out that that is just not true. That's just not what's going on. Um, and even the Fed has come out and, and said that that is actually not true. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, the people that received that extra $600 a week were, were ready to go back to work. Because people want to have meaning. They want to have purpose in what's going on, in what they're doing. They don't want to do, you know, the menial tasks. Uh, it's part of the reason why you have a lot of people in my generation that don't want to work in factories, that don't want to work these industrial jobs, because that's not what gives them meaning. That's not to say that, you know, nobody wants to be a janitor or something like that. I think there are some people that enjoy cleaning. There are some people that enjoy doing some of the grunt work. There are people that like working with their hands, mechanics, you know, HVAC, um, uh, uh, techs, I guess is what they would be called, engineers, uh, you know, uh, people that work in sanitation. Like, there's a lot of people that are like, they find purpose in that. They find purpose in, um, in being in those industries. But, you know, with automation coming, that, that does mean that we have to find some deeper meaning in our work that goes beyond just making a paycheck and paying our bills. Um, and that's, that's kind of what this idea has started to, 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 to bring up, especially the fact that like, yeah, the people were receiving money, but they wanted to still work. Like they didn't want to just sit around and do nothing. So, you know, it's either figuring out how to take that extra $600 a week that they were getting and finding out how much of that they, um, needed for bills and to pay all their things and then to find out okay what do we do with this extra do i give it to a cause do i reinvest it into something exciting that i wanted to do something that i've always wanted to start uh and the study basically finds that they they were still looking for work now uh larry kudlow let me figure out who larry kudlow exactly is because i forget uh he's the economic advisor for the white house larry kudlow he, uh, he said that we're paying people not to work. That's what Larry Kudlow claims. We're paying people not to work. Well, maybe. I, I, this might be a little too revolutionary of, uh, of an idea I'm throwing out here, but maybe uh, we should fucking pay people to work. Maybe we should pay people a livable wage. Maybe their wage should go up based on the inflation in the country. Maybe you should allow small businesses to thrive instead of giving tax breaks to companies like Amazon and Walmart to squash small businesses out, to basically make the market in their favor. You know, maybe you should let small businesses be able to pay their employees a little bit more by making it a little bit easier to be a small business in America. Maybe you should let workers join unions and treat them fairly. Maybe, maybe we should, we should have that. Maybe we should have more meaningful jobs in America. Just maybe, Larry, maybe. Instead of treating workers like dog shit and, uh, you know, like, they're just grunts to make Jeff Bezos a fucking trillionaire. You could give, you could help them out and pay them what they're worth. See what that does. Maybe there'll be less civil unrest in the streets if people are just treated properly. Even the Chicago Fed, the Chicago Federal Reserve came out and said, yeah, 
the people that received the unemployment benefits were still looking for jobs. Uh, uh, more of them were looking for jobs than the ones that didn't. And the ones that didn't, I'm not saying are lazy, by the way. I'm, there, there's a lot of mitigating factors, especially when you spend so much time looking for a job. Global pandemic hits. You try to get unemployment. And then you fall through the cracks of the system. And you get defeated. I've been there. It sucks. It, like, you fall into a depressive hole. You don't want to do anything. You know? I've been there. I've, I've, I've sat around and just watched Netflix for hours on end. Didn't really want to fucking do anything. And a week or two goes by. Then you get, and then I got my fucking shit together. Because, well, for... I think my anxiety kind of overdrives my depression. Uh, and then thoughts get stuck up here. And if they don't come out, I get more, like, anxious and annoyed. And, you know, so it, it, there's just, like, shit buzzing in my head all the time. Uh, so that kind of gears me to go <laughs> uh, and start doing shit um, a lot more. But I've definitely been there. I've definitely been completely defeated, you know, over certain things. Even in the, in the even in the world of comedy, it's like I've I I vie for a gig for so hard, or I'm, I'm trying to like get this tour to come together, and you know, it's like I, it, 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 the the tour is let's say three weeks. It's like a three week planned tour, and it doesn't come together the way that I want. I get maybe 10 out of the 21 dates. And then I kind of feel shitty about it. And I don't do anything about it for like two days. I, it's depressing and it's it burns you out. I get it. And that's probably what those folks might have been going through. It doesn't mean that they're lazy. It just means that like, yeah, things are shitty. And that's whenever instead of attacking those people and you know, pretending like you're holier than thou because you have a job or, you know, you have better circumstances than they do, maybe fucking lend them a hand, you know? Especially if this is a Christian nation, maybe you should do the Christian thing and actually be kind and take care of the people in your country. That's another thing, right? I, you know, is, is the Republican Party claims to be this Christian party, claim to be, you know, uh, that, that America is a Christian nation. Yet we don't do any, I mean, America doesn't do shit that matches being a Christian. How many homeless people do, do, do churches take in? I mean, you could turn a church into a homeless shelter immediately. Like right now, especially during a pandemic, get a cleaning crew, sanitize the church, Get beds and stuff six feet apart and help people stay there. Some of these churches are fucking massive. And instead they'll get tax breaks to be closed and not do a fucking thing. How many Republicans are out there making legislation to help homeless people right now? To help people that are going to get evicted out of their homes? You know what they don't, you know what they do say? It's their fault that they're getting kicked out of their homes. They didn't work hard enough and they didn't try hard enough. It's like, we're in a fucking pandemic. Where are these jobs going to come from? Mitch McConnell is standing up there with this new fucking stimulus bill trying to get Americans back to work. For what? That's what this pandemic has shown us. What are we working for? What are some of these jobs here for? Do you really need to, 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 to get your fucking, you know, goddamn planes, trains, and automobiles DVD fucking in your, ha in your hands in, in a day with Amazon? No, you don't. You know how that shit happens? By overworked workers, exhausted in a goddamn warehouse, not getting paid enough money. Meanwhile, Jeff Bezos is making a trillion dollars. That's not the Christian thing to do. This, I, this, this instance, especially right here, I think has uh, brought up the question of meaningful work. Brought up the question that people were getting paid. Literally, like one of the things that, that was happening with the $600 additional is that people were making way more fucking money with that unemployment than they were when they were fucking employed. 
right? So when the Republicans found that, they were like, oh my God, people are never going to go back to work again. And the question is, why would they? And two, you saw that people were still looking for work, which means that this is more about meaning and purpose than it is about getting rich and scamming the system for most of us. And instead of finding a way to provide new, more meaningful work, you're going to put them in more dangerous conditions. Back to the warehouses, back to the meatpacking plants, back to being frontline workers with a bunch of assholes that are going to scream at them about wearing masks in the stores. They're going to cough on them and spit on them and attack them. That's not meaningful work. You could automate a bunch of, I mean, and that's coming. That's on its way. And once that happens, what's next? This new stimulus bill that's coming up, right, is um, another $1,200. Uh, yeah, this is another $1,200 that's coming directly to Americans. Um is is a bit of a joke, just like the last one was. Do I think people could use it? Oh, absolutely. Could I use an extra twelve hundred dollars? Oh, you you bet your ass I could. I would. There are quite a few bills I would be able to either, um, you know, really take care of, or just significantly reduce. That is not going to help me in the long run. It would be nice for the month of August and maybe into the month of September. But in the long run, oh goodness no. They're extending some unemployment stuff. It... Here's a quote by Steny Hoyer. He said, look, it's not $600 or bust. Uh, Pelosi said the other day, which I thought was a great line, we don't have red lines, we have values. We're going into these negotiations with values. Okay. What values? Yeah, that, that's not really particularly defined. We don't have red lines, but values? What are your values? Nancy Pelosi has come out and declined a universal basic income because the Republicans might be mean, which is which which there was such major pushback from everybody within the Democratic Party towards Pamela Jayapal for bringing that up when the Heroes Act was being written back in May or June that she doesn't want to fucking do anything anymore. She she was one of one of like the leading people within the Democratic Party that might have been on our side. And she don't want to do nothing anymore because the party beat it out of her for something that every fucking modernized country is doing right now. Pelosi doesn't want to do Medicare for all, but she wants to increase COBRA at a point where there's a pandemic going on. You want to get people to pay more. And then people wonder why I'm not a fucking Democrat. And they just came out and said that the DNC's platform is not for Medicare for all. They don't really want to defund the police. Joe Biden's plan is to shoot people in the leg. At what's fucking Nancy Pelosi's plan? To read the names of all the people that have been murdered by the cops? And then what? We banned chokeholds. Why was that not banned in the first place? Why was that allowed in the fucking first place? There's no, I mean, the small business buffers, same thing. They, they're doing some PPE shit, which, which would then kick these people off unemployment. They have more small business loans. And are we going to see the same shit again that we saw back in April? Where a bunch of corporations are going to take uh, advantage of that shit? Where's the provision put into place that corporations can't do that for small business loans? No one, no, one in, no one in Congress wants to talk about that.
but they will talk about how unemployment might de-incentivize people to work when that's not true. It's a fucking propagandized line. I mean, I, th and this argument has been made for every, from, uh, for, uh, forever by people that are pro-UBI. I've come out and said it many times in various fucking videos. And every time, there's always these fucking, these, these neoliberals that think they're smarter than everybody. And these conservatives that are, you know, very like, we gotta, it's a Christian nation, people gotta work. All fucking come out and say, well, if you give people money, they will not want to work. They're all fucking lazy. And they won't want to work because human beings are awful. And we're terrible creatures and we'll never go to work. It's a crock of shit. It's a crock of shit. If you give people $2,000 a month instead of another $7 trillion to the banks, if you do that for the next six months, it's the same amount of fucking money. Um, and you would help out the people. You would have less homelessness in America. You would probably have less crime due to that uh, because, because being homeless is a crime in America. You would have less, probably less civil unrest in the streets. You can sit there and say, well, where would you get the money? Decrease the military budget, decrease the police budgets. There's two points right there. Offer people Medicare for all. Make sure that they're taken care of. Give hospitals what they need. This is not the time for, the, for war. The entire world is called a, a, a peace treaty and, and an armistice, and you're still ready to fucking blow some shit up. And the, ridiculous. And then people sit there and wonder... Well, Chris, why aren't you a fucking Democrat? Are you not paying attention? It's wild. It's wild. But, this, but I mean, you saw the Fed. The Fed even came out and was just like, yeah, people want to work even when they're on unemployment. It kind of means that people, there's like more meaning about this stuff. And maybe we, maybe when there isn't meaningful work to be had, we should help people out financially so they're, so that, they can use that capital to find meaningful work. But that's not the direction they're going to go. And then people wonder, well, Chris, why aren't you a fucking Democrat? Well, the Democrats don't want you to have meaningful work either. Just like the Republicans do. All right, folks. That is the... Um, the conclusion of this video, uh, like I said, doing the Fringe Festival, uh, 6 p.m. on July 30th, 31st. Uh, I'll be live streaming with the Indian Association of Greater Boston at 9 p.m. on Friday, July 31st. And then the Citizen Revolution goes back to its uh, regularly scheduled events starting August 7th and then on August 14th and August 28th. On August 8th, I'm doing the No Thanks virtual stand-up comedy show hosted by my friend Jimmy Calloway. Uh, all of this information was going to be available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. I hope you can join me um, in some of these virtual events. Uh, you don't even have to leave your home. You don't really even have to wear pants, uh, which is very exciting. Um, I, I guess if you're not into wearing pants inside your homes. Uh, but that's all. That's it for today. Make sure you share this stuff. Make sure you get the word out. Uh, but till next time, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the road.